we'd have to say that uh, it would be harder for New Zealand and Ireland to be further apart, geographically speaking. Um, and I can certainly attest to that, having made the, the, the journey here um, the day before yesterday. Um, but while we're a long way apart on the map, it's also true that we have uh, a great deal, um, I think, in common. We share some common heritage. We're each very proud of and support our Indigenous culture. Uh, and the Irish cultural diaspora is very evident in New Zealand. I think I'm about the only New Zealander I know that can't claim uh, to have Irish heritage. And um, it's to my eternal regret that that is the case. Um, we're similar in other important ways too, and that's, um, as Tom has hinted, uh, why I'm very interested to talk to you this morning. Um, we've got small, globalised economies uh, that are more outward focused than uh, some of our major trading partners. Uh, our populations are growing, uh, and growing in New Zealand's case quite significantly due to migration. But outside our cities, uh, the population density is pretty low. Um, and like Ireland, New Zealand is built um, essentially on the land sector. And our farming systems uh, are again very similar, mostly based on pastoral agriculture. That makes a huge um, contribution to our economy, and I'd be willing to bet that there are few other countries where the price um, of dairy or uh, milk prices would be headline news, uh, watched closely not just by the farming sector, but also uh, by <coughs> currency traders. In any given year, um, New Zealand's land sector produces about 70% um, of the value uh, of our merchandise experts, uh, exports, so we are far from being um, a normal industrialised economy. But because of that, like Ireland, uh, the land sector emissions account for a very significant share of our greenhouse gases, and that's why I'm here this morning. So for us, about half of our emissions come from agriculture, Majority of that being methane uh, from rumen digestion, uh, with nitrous oxide uh, from animal excretion and fertiliser making up the bulk of the rest. As we know, emissions are closely linked to agricultural production, which is in turn linked to pastoral growth, stock numbers and climatic conditions. We produce, therefore we emit, if I can paraphrase Descartes. Um, in Ireland's case, as I understand it, about a third of emissions are from agriculture, and uh, your emissions here have similar characteristics uh, to our own. So we face the same sort of challenges in mitigating emissions from very complex biological systems. Well, as an agricultural exporting nation, we give a huge amount of attention to how the land sector is dealt with in uh, climate change negotiations. Um, it pre presents us with plenty of challenges, um, but we also think there are some opportunities, um, always opportunities, opportunities, I think. Um, if people are driven to um, respond to change, it's a, a driver for innovation uh, and diversification. But for both of us as developed countries, we're kind of outliers. We're very different uh, from the rest um, of the developing, um, most of the rest of the developing countries within the climate change uh, context. For most countries, <coughs> where the bulk uh, of emissions are CO2 from burning fossil fuels, tackling climate change is about getting to grips with energy use. Whether that's moving from coal to renewables or encouraging greater energy efficiency, it's energy that holds the key. But things are pretty different for agriculture. There's no silver bullet. And that's not to say, I'm not going to suggest that, that, that tackling energy um, emissions is easy. Of course, it's got its own challenges as well. But at the very least, the technology is there. Um, there are a number of, of different options for clean energy. Costs are coming down. And in many parts of the world, including in New Zealand, they're now at a par um, with uh, fossil fuel uh, genera power generation. Uh, and there are a number of viable options for, for governments and business to make as sort of shifting from brown uh, to green investments. 
So in our view, we need to recognise that agriculture is different when it comes to responding to climate change. And first and foremost, as we all know, uh, emissions and global food production are increasing. Uh, and we're going to need to keep increasing food production with uh, population growth on the planet forecast to increase to 9 billion people uh, by 2050. Um, so we'll need to increase production by as much as 60% by then to feed uh, that growing population. Uh, increase in food production, but we'll have to do that in ways that focus on improvements in yield and efficiency. And we're also going to have to decouple uh, growth, uh, growth in, in production from growth in emissions and from growth in agricultural land use. Um, I'm probably again speaking to the converted, but agricultural emissions arise from complex biological systems. Um, and it's really a challenging proposition to change the biology of our soils uh, and livestock. We've invested an enormous amount of money in research and continue to do so. And some of that early research has had very promising results, whether that's um, vaccines, uh, genetic breeding, um, and a couple of other um, uh, innovations that we have tried. But it's also highlighted some important challenges. New te technologies we know can face significant regulatory and consumer hurdles. And certainly our experience in the last year has reminded us just how incredibly sensitive consumers are uh, when it comes to anything to do with food. Um, so there are significant issues that need to be dealt with, with there. Many of the promising technologies are still experimental, not proven in the field, and so far at least, um, they're expensive at scale. So in the meantime, we think there are opportunities to reduce emissions through uh, efficiency. The FAO recently estimated that uh, um, we could get uh, a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, that's globally, if livestock producers in any given system adopted pr practices and technologies employed by the most efficient 10% uh, of producers. So that's a significant um, uh, improvement in greenhouse gas emissions from efficiency uh, uh, gains uh, alone. Domestically, um, New Zealand's found that, that that relationship definitely holds true within our own farm systems, and I think it's the same with Ireland here. We would add that in our experience, these um, emissions-efficient farmers uh, are also the most productive uh, and profitable. So there is definitely a, um, a double win uh, associated with this. Um, this ability to reduce emissions through efficiency gains is an important opportunity um, and one that risks, though, being a bit lost in the wider challenges uh, that the sector faces. As we see it, there are two focuses for the agriculture sector. First, scaling up research in new technologies to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and improve yields in the longer term. So that's really finding the new solutions for the longer term, while at the same time having a short-term focus on improving agricultural productivity and emissions efficiency. Um, and there is plenty of room for manoeuvre there. We've observed that um, agriculture really isn't helped by international climate change agreements that uh, encourage us to treat agriculture and emissions in the same way as those from industry and energy sectors. If we look at the UNFCCC, um, beyond uh, reporting and accounting rules, the Convention is, re is just silent on how we should treat agriculture. The Kyoto Protocol also combines emissions from all sources, including from agriculture, and then it requires countries to take an economy-wide commitment relative to those total emissions. Of course, countries have flexibility um, to be able to make their own choices on how to achieve the target, um, and on the whole, developed countries absorb their emissions from agriculture into their economy-wide target. Now, that's easy if, as for most, um, agriculture accounts for less than 10% of your total emissions. Um, 
but it's, and, and there you can get some traction trading off action in one sector over inaction in another and still manage to secure absolute reductions in your economy-wide emissions. It's more problematic um, if a sector with limited abatement options dominates your emissions. As a government, you've got fewer tools in your toolbox. And I guess I always think of it like a basket of eggs. If you've got a, um, a set of hen's eggs um, in your, your basket, you've got some options to play with. If you've got a bloody great ostrich egg <laughs> in the middle of your basket and a couple of other ones around it, um, you've got uh, fewer things uh, um, at your disposal. So what's New Zealand done? We joined the Kyoto Protocol, we remain a party to it, uh, and we've met uh, our first commitment period obligations. We did that um, by introducing as our principal policy tool uh, an emissions trading scheme um, and plugging that into the global carbon market. Uh, the New Zealand ETS is designed to cover all sectors and all gases. And it's being implemented in stages. So the first uh, to come in was forestry in 2008. Um, industrial processes, stationary energy and waste joined the scheme about two years later. And so it now covers about half of all of our emissions. We found that the scheme worked well in some areas, um, but not so well, we'd have to, we'd be the first to admit in others. Initially, it very strongly encouraged new forest planting, and I think that might be of interest uh, to, to Ireland, given the afforestation programs that, that you have here. It also helped to encourage new investment in grid-scale renewable energy, uh, especially electricity generation. But as you will also be aware, being part of the um, EU ETS, price, uh, prices have declined steeply. So that price signal um, is not uh, delivering so much, meaning the scheme hasn't made a dent on our transport emissions that account for 20% um, of our total emissions. Um, and it's less of an encouragement to forestry than it was at the start. Now, so far, it hasn't included agriculture directly. Um, and there were some challenges to that. Uh, one of those uh, was to, to um, in order to ensure that you got a price signal to farmers, we were going to have to um, uh, model, <coughs> model emissions at the farm level. But with more than 60,000 farmers, the administrative um, costs of doing that uh, have not proved viable. Um, the uh, other consideration that government took into account was the lack of um, uh, viable mitigation options. Uh, and certainly uh, there were quite considerable representations from the farming sector um, on the basis of carbon leakage and competitive concerns uh, that um, imposing a price on them um, when no such constraints uh, or comparable uh, uh, measures were in place anywhere else in the world um, was was um, uh, not tenable and would put them in a, in a competitive disadvantage. Uh, now, without commercially viable solutions, it seems to our farming sector and indeed to us that the only way to reduce emissions from agriculture is to reduce production. Now, that would obviously have severe impacts on, on our economy. Um, uh, yes, uh, reducing agricultural production in New Zealand would reduce our national emissions. But on a global level, we're well aware that agricultural demand uh, would remain the same and would be filled from elsewhere. And in all probability, uh, through less emissions efficient sources. And I think that's a consideration that, that um, uh, Ireland has as well. Certainly, um, I think we're both amongst the most uh, emissions efficient producers uh, in the world. And the other, um, I guess, point is that if demand isn't met, then global food prices start to rise um, and there are um, other uh, security issues that, that come into play. Uh, um, so for the moment, uh, agriculture is covered in our ETS through reporting obligations only, 
without having the accompanying surrender obligations. Although, and, and even at that stage, it's pretty important to have reporting obligations because it does at least sensitise the sector um, to uh, um, their emissions uh, and uh, can help to, to drive some innovation. Um, outside the UNFCCC process, uh, because although that's important to us, we haven't put all our ostrich or other eggs in that particular basket where we're active in other ways. Uh, we took the initiative to launch the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases in December 1999. We've been very pleased uh, that Ireland has been an active founding member since then. The Alliance um, now has 42 member countries and through pooling research uh, effort, the aim is to find game-changing solutions. Um, but also at a much simpler and more practical level use information sharing on best practices so that you get constant simple imp improvements through better productivity. Um, we also joined the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, uh, another uh, cooperative initiative that Ireland is, is participating in. And we see that's a good complement to the GRA. It takes R&D on to an implementation phase um, and we've been closely involved on a CCAC project on manure management, now working with partners on the development of a, um, a project on enteric fermentation. And that's, that's a really good partnership to extend out uh, the GRA research. We were really interested in and encouraged by uh, the launch of the new Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture um, at the Climate Summit Tom referred to um, last month. <coughs> Um, and that's really important, we think, uh, with the Alliance looking to leverage a triple win uh, for food security, climate change adaptation uh, and greenhouse gas mit mitigation through improving productivity, efficiency uh, and resilience. Um, just quickly, uh, domestically, you're probably well aware that, that we went through um, big changes in the 1970s, um, removing all forms of agricultural subsidy. So our farmers have a market-led focus on productivity and efficiency uh, improvements, and they've significantly reduced the uh, emissions intensity of our um, production. Uh, to help that, we established uh, um, uh, an agricultural greenhouse gas research centre and that leads the way in mitigation research. Um, if you wanted to look at its first annual report, check out the link. There's some really interesting results from its um, first couple of years of, of, um, of activity. Um, the other thing that we've done is set up the Primary Growth Partnership. It's a collaborative effort between uh, industry and, and government, sort of 50-50 funding to develop uh, and support research projects that enhance primary sector sustainability and deliver long-term economic growth, a very successful par partnership. And through those sorts of things, on an aggregate basis, although our um, agricultural emissions have increased... 12% since 1990. Uh, productivity gains means that our emissions per unit of production have actually decreased by around 30% since 1990, and they do keep reducing. So we're actively looking at ways to um, continue an annual improvement um, in emissions intensity. We've also got a growing focus on water quality. Um, driven particularly by a big shift towards dairy production um, in, uh, in the New Zealand agricultural scene. That's going to be um, another driver of on-farm innovation and resource use efficiency. Um, most of the focus is on better management of nutrient uh, and effluent flows to improve water quality. But um, doing those things will also have important climate change benefits. Uh, through more efficient use of effluent and fertiliser and improved pasture management. So we're really looking to leverage the synergies um, that are there. Just to go back now um, to, to finish with the uh, international negotiations. <clears throat> I've talked about all of the things we have done. One of the things New Zealand hasn't done um, is joined the Kyoto Protocol's second commitment period. 
This is because we're firmly of the view that we need to transition away uh, from, a climate, uh, from a Kyoto Protocol worldview. Uh, we really think that it's um, the divide between developed and developing countries is completely outdated. We must move to an ambitious new agreement that is genuinely applicable to all countries and where national circumstances can be better accounted for. Um, we really don't think um, that the Kyoto Protocol was written for countries like ours in mind. Um, in this new world, uh, New Zealand and Ireland, with our agriculture heavy emissions profiles, we're no longer the outliers. Um, there's a number of developing countries that have similar emissions profiles to ours, um, and for many their share of agricultural emissions is even higher. So Brazil has a remarkably similar profile to New Zealand. We're both about 50-50 um, agricultural emissions. Um, and uh, for Uruguay, the percentage is somewhat over 80%. So the old-style economy-wide approach makes it politically and technically infeasible for many developing countries to participate in a way um, that can easily include their agriculture sectors. Uh, we think we should be aiming for an agreement that does uh, cover all sectors and all gases. If nearly, I think it's between 25 and 30 percent of global emissions from agriculture, forestry and other land use, if they're left out of the equation entirely, then we can in no way claim that we are dealing with a global problem. But to do so, we need to recognise the multiple objectives in the land sector and that different countries are going to have different priorities for how agriculture contributes to their climate change response. The Paris Agreement, we think, has to reflect this and demonstrate that the challenges for agriculture are understood. Um, one way of doing this would be to agree principles for approaches in the land sector um, uh, and how these might be reflected in nationally determined contributions. Um, and we've developed some thinking about what some principles might, might look like. Um, I think it... What the agreement has to recognise is that we don't yet have all the answers. So it needs to create the right policy environment to actively encourage and intensify investment in research and development. That's a, a key thing that this agreement must do. Um, we also and I've just talked about the room for, for global advances through improved efficiency and on-farm management practices, so the new agreement should actively encourage and enable countries to take targets that fit with this, that are around uh, recognising the, the, the benefits, the, uh, the uh, emissions benefits that flow from improved efficiency and on-farm management practices. The other thing is we need to start thinking differently about agricultural greenhouse gases. We were really interested in the fifth assessment report that the IPCC published um, earlier this year. I think the, the last bit is, is um, about due to come out. So the science is telling us that with agriculture we have a little bit of time up our sleeves. The IPCC has confirmed that, that CO2 from fossil fuels is the most urgent climate change issue. Um, the AR5, the fifth Fifth Assessment Report confirmed that under most of their modelling scenarios, we can allow non-CO2 emissions uh, from gases like methane to remain at their current levels as late as 2050 um, and still have a reasonable chance of meeting um, our two degree uh, target. So we won't miss that goal if um, under the new agreement, uh, and certainly to begin with, we treat agriculture a little differently. So for the short term, just to reiterate, we need to manage and minimise biological emissions by focusing on efficiency gains without compromising our ability to feed a, glowing, a growing global population, and in the longer <coughs> term, we need innovative solutions. Um, we think there's a good landing zone for Paris here. Uh, that could see agriculture addressed in a, a really practical and effective way in the 2015 agreement. Uh, the time's ripe now, in fact it's probably overripe, 
uh, to have these com conversations, but we're obviously going to have to advance other um, aspects of the negotiations. Um, one thing that underpins every aspect of the negotiation is how you deal with the differentiation between developed and developing countries. And in the agricultural space, just as much as with anything else, and perhaps even more so, um, trying to find and navigate a way through this differentiation problem <coughs> is going to be uh, absolutely key. So looking ahead to next year, um, we think that an agreement in Paris is certainly doable, but it is going to be um, a big challenge. Um, you know, I've been saying for the last year or, or maybe more that the landing zone for Paris is quite clear. You can see um, pretty much where the agreement needs to come out and what would deliver um, a genuinely effective climate agreement that would have a high level of participation and would enable ambition to be maximised. But it's one thing to see a landing zone, it's another thing to successfully bring um, the, uh, the agreement to uh, a conclusion. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, for those, um, there are a couple in this room who um, uh, sit closely to the negotiations, there is a huge disjunct um, between what's happening in the formal negotiations um, and what happens in informal um, meeting rooms where uh, the conversation can be much, much more constructive um, and where you can see where it's possible to, uh, to find convergence. So we're going to have, it would seem, in this new agreement, a hybrid uh, between um, what's been called top-down and bottom-up. We'll have a hybrid then um, of um, uh, overarching rules or parameters um, through a legally binding agreement um, and a bottom-up component of nationally determined commitments. Where we see these two things meeting is that, um, uh, and we've called this, this zone, bounded flexibility, because the agreement part of it implies rules, legally binding. The nationally determined part of it implies lots of flexibility. Do whatever you can, just you know, get it on the table. So we need to, to define the area where those two things intersect, the parameters or the boundaries that you put around um, the flexibility, the opt-outs, the, um, uh, the kind of specific um, uh, circumstances that individual countries might face as an alternative to negotiating an agreement that just drops down to the lowest common denominator. Um, so we think that, that finding this, this landing zone is going to be the best way to maximise participation and ambition, and it is what is sitting behind our thinking on the land sector. We've been really interested, um, and I think the, the Climate Summit helped, um, to see that political momentum is steadily building for these negotiations. Um, there's no doubt that it is um, being strongly driven um, by the US um, and China, and of course the European Union is um, uh, showing leadership um, with the more transparent process uh, that uh, with 28 member states it's always necessary to, to go through um, to, to work out what it is that, uh, that can be put on the table uh, by way of nationally determined contributions um, by around March of next year. So um, with President Obama making, this, making it clear that this is a legacy issue for his administration, with intensive discussions with China, and China being driven um, uh, by, for domestic reasons by their severe and urgent need to deal with um, air pollution problems, um, we think that there is um, a golden political opportunity here um, that needs to be seized. And it's time for those of us with an interest in agriculture to see how we can make it work, both in and alongside the UNFCCC. We think we need some high-level understandings about agriculture. We need to um, make sure uh, that the cooperative initiatives that sit alongside the UNFCCC help it, help the UNFCCC to come to a solution, but don't 
duplicate or, or cut across it. And we also need countries to be ready to take on ambitious but achievable targets, including their land sector. And by achievable, achievable I mean both politically as well as techni technically feasible. So I'm going to stop there to leave, I hope, a little bit of time for sure. questions. I'm happy to talk about anything climate change related. Thank you very much.